I'd just like to frame the discussion here uh, because the, the origin of this um, is in some sense the origin of this entire day uh, on education and virtue. And it goes back to conversations that I had with both uh, Dr. Hall and also with um, Mr. Luddy, the founder of Thales Academy, because I asked him um, if there was something you really wanted to understand as the founder of a classical academy, um, what would it be? So what sort of new insight, what would address either your, your core challenge from an educational point of view um, or some sort of significant gain uh, for you? Uh, and he said this issue of, uh, of education having a lasting effect as opposed to sort of being part of someone's early experience but without um, a longer effect. And we, we spoke, this, this topic got going during the, um, uh, during some of the crisis in the church, uh, and he, we were talking also about seminarians, and he was um, sort of just struck by the fact that a seminarian um, has such a long period of formation. Uh, of course, one can, <laughs> not all seminaries are created equal, those are other matters, but uh, he was still struck that one could have so much formation in moral theology and in philosophy, and also a strong practical element with parish assignments and so on, and still have the kind of uh, sort of lack, a sort of rudderless ship, um, both at the level of the priest and then the bishops. And of course, Bob, Bob Luddy does not think that his classical academy will solve all of these problems, but for him, it's, it's sort of, it's, it's at the core of what he hopes to achieve um, in his education. Um, so the questions that we'll be ad ad addressing here are in what respect can that be achieved? Obviously, we're not just um, uh, producing uh, products in a factory lineup. We're, 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 we're forming persons, free persons. Um, but nevertheless, uh, there, there are all sorts of good reasons. And certainly any of us who are trying to uh, renew and build up culture, I mean, that's a lasting goal. That's not just... Um, sort of trying to offer sort of excellence in a very brief window. One is trying to achieve something, uh, sort of form human beings who will go into the world in certain ways and live and bear witness to truth and serve and so on. So that's very broadly put the, 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 the core question of this panel, and as I said, in some sense, the reason um, uh, that we're, we've even devoted this day to education and virtue. And so with that, I'll turn it over. We're going to go begin with... Dr. Hall, so the floor is yours, my right. friend. Thank you, John Henry. We're excited to be here. Um, and, and John Henry's right. We're very interested in, in bringing classical education and really taking, you know, uh, reasoning philosophy and bringing it to praxis. And that was a lot of the intent of this this particular tract is, is to get the reasoning, bring that co concepts down to praxis. So in the next few minutes, I guess I'll, I'll detail a little bit about uh, 19th century Danish uh, philosopher Soren Kierkegaard's uh, understanding of education in relation to the individual, while also hoping to provide some comparative points of some generally accepted tenets of personalism. From my view, you know, it, it, being uh, steeped into Kierkegaard all these years, I see a lot of connections. And what I would like to do you know, moving forward as, as a Thales Academy is being able to bring personalism into our schools in some sort of way, into praxis. So, um, to begin with, from a curricular standpoint, Kierkegaard advocated for the development of the students' metacognitive cognitive processes with a focus on the process of, of life rather than the end material product. And I'll quote Kierkegaard here. Um, what then is education? I believe it the course the individual goes through in order to catch up with himself. And the person will not go through this course is not much help by being born in the most enlightened age. And going back to some of the, the information age um, topic we had last, you know, Kierkegaard was really concerned about the fact that you know, we were in this age, and this is 19th century, and so he's saying this is, that was an information age, that we were inundated with information, but not able to process it, not able to do anything but to swim in it without making any commitment to it. So with this quote, Kierkegaard suggests that education should be focused on the development of the self, regardless of the amount of knowledge in the form of facts or data are available to the learner. So there's the self the personhood that needs to be developed. Facts are important, they're needed, but selfhood that needs to be developed. 
as such, curriculum should provide for the good life, not in the material sense, but in the Socratic sense. And of course, Kierkegaard was a, a big fan of Socrates. His PhD dissertation focused on Socratic irony. So definitely he had appreciation for the Socratic life, the Socratic sense of a good life. So according to Kierkegaard, curriculum should not only test factual information, but also, also for the test of life and how we act in response to the, those tests. I always like this quote. I don't remember who told it to me as a principal years ago, said, we really don't want to prepare our students for a life of tests, but the test of life. And that's very important. We definitely want our students to do well cognitively, you know, do well on cognitive tests. But we want to prepare them for the test of life, not just for tests. Of course, the problem with this curricular focus is that paradoxically, it's a huge task and it makes it very hard to assess this. How do you assess that somebody has a sense of a good life? Moreover, let's be honest, students want the easy way out and possibly parents as well. Okay, Many just want the answer in which to learn, recite, and move on. Okay, as uh, Kierkegaard uh, verifies this in another reflection, there are many people who, uh, who arrive at conclusions in life much the way schoolboys do. They cheat their teachers by copying the answer book without having worked the problem themselves. They copy the answers without working the problem themselves. For Kierkegaard, that's important, that we need to, 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 um, to really uh, learn ourselves, subjectivity, okay? Subjectivity of learning, taking it on to ourselves. So the role of the teacher is to assist students in developing a subjective understanding of the content. Kierkegaard's notion of subjectivity encapsulates a person's interpretation and internalization of knowledge. This subjectivity is dissimilar to the more, most, more postmodern perspective of the term. It doesn't mean you know, truth does not exist. Instead, subjectivity implies an attitude in which the individual assumes the responsibility for knowledge and decisions by taking choices seriously and making commitments in spite of uncertainty. So Kierkegaard's curricular uh, subjectivity involves two instructional approaches. And I'll be very brief. I'm trying to rush through I'm knowing my time. The first is that the dialectic that emphasizes, and I quote, taking a questioning and critical stance, striving to see all possible angles in a situation or with a problem, especially seeing what counts against one's view. This methodology of asking questions advocated by Kierkegaard, of which Socrates was the most noble practitioner, includes statements of uh, clarification and, and, and more statements and more questions. Dissimilar to Socratic dialogues, Kierkegaard's dialectic had uh, interplay through his writing through pseudonyms, each representing a different perspective to consider and grapple with. For us at Thales in particular, we focus in on Socratic dialogues. We've developed a framework to, to make those work well. I always mention this in new teacher orientation. We don't want to throw a copy of the Iliad as, at a th new teacher and say, hey, teach this Socratically because it doesn't help, doesn't provide that framework to make that work well. And so what we want to do is make that work well. Another way of instruction was indirect communication. Of course, Kierkegaard li liked to use a, a variety of ways to indirectly communicate something through pseudonyms, irony, and parables. Um, he wanted to deceive the reader into truth. Now, there is some question to whether this is really a, a good way of teaching, the deceptive way. but Indirect communication, to some degree, through parables, was used by Jesus. It allows us to think through things. This methodolo methodological approach puts the responsibility and accountability for learning in the hands of the student, which is an essential element to Kierkegaard's uh, perspective of education. I'm trying to be quick as well. Um, as part of this mixture of dialectic and indirect communication, Kierkegaard makes uh, much like his beloved Socrates, refuses to give answers, but rather keeps students in a state of um, disequilibrium in order to promote 
and or provoke, depending on your perspective, the student into making a choice. Since the act of choice, not speculative thinking, is what constitutes existence in a student's education. Of course, this is a difficult pedagogical position for a teacher. As a Kierkegaard articulates, many students are eager just to have the answer from an authority. To add to the, this precarious position that teachers have, uh, a teacher is also re rooted in subjectivity. The dialectic indirect communication never has the authoritative role, but only one is a learner. A teacher is also a learner, not an authority. For a lot of teachers, this is difficult because they come into the classroom needing to be authority. Remember, you have 30 high school students. You need to be an authority. There are 30 high school students in the room. But for a Kierkegaard standpoint, that is not where the teacher needs to be. They always have to display intellectual humility and also be a learner. All right. So, so if a teacher becomes too occupied with the authoritative position, they're not really teaching. If a teacher is an authority, too authoritative, they're not really teaching. This doesn't mean that Kierkegaard denied all authority. He was rooted in Western tradition, which arguably revolves around authoritative uh, stances, rather is suggestive of the balance that needs to be maintained by the teacher. So lastly is, how do you assess this type of education where there's subjectivity involved, where student has to take it in and they have to learn it for themselves, indirect communication, di dialectic? Well, to be honest, it's very difficult. It's very difficult to assess it if you assess it in modern day terms, which is test scores. What we really have to do to assess this type of education is look at it from life scores. How well do they do in life? Are they good people to themselves and the people around them? And that's going back to those um, the ideas of personalism. If you take Kierkegaard and you kind of map them out and compare them in a Venn diagram to personalism, you find Personalism also has the subjectivity of learning. Also the idea of you know, free will, self-determined learning, not being determined. And then also ethical responsibilities for their own learning. Those are all personalistic aspects that are there. And then finally, I think uh, the value of the development of personhood as an important part of the educational enterprise, meaning that teachers have an important responsibility they're educating the personhood of all 30 students in their class. That's an important responsibility. Now, from this uh, conference, all I was hoping to do was to, to gain an early exploration of the academic and praxis of Kierkegaard personalism and education. I really hope we can generate some further dialogue from that. Thank you very much. So I'm again going to speak to you on the thought of Edith Stein and, of course, this time, Stein's conception of education. We first need to notice that Stein had a defined focus on education in her own life. First, in its practice, in her role as a teacher, and she was an incredibly devoted teacher, and this is testified to by her many students. And then, in theory, in terms of her philosophical focus. Now, her philosophical focus or interest on education arises from her interest in the human person and, more precisely, the formation of the human person. And so Stein understood education as the formation of the human person. I'm going to read a quote. We understand education to concern the formation of the entire human being in all his or her powers and capabilities. Immediately from this, we see that she does not have a narrow or constricted understanding of education. Education for Stein is not merely intellectual. Education is, for Stein is not merely the transfer of facts that can be memorized and repeated back. And education is certainly not the formation of employees that can be the cog to the industrial economy. No, for Stein, education is personal. And the reason she's interested in education is because she's interested in the person. Now, how is it personal? Well, it's personal in its subject, object, and end. It is always human persons who are the subjects of education, those who do the educating. It is always human persons who are educated, the object of education. And the end of education is in a fully formed human person. Now, I'm going to touch upon four points that highlight this in the thought of Stein. 
though there are many more we could do. And the first is the individual. Though for Stein, education happens in a social context and involves a general conception of the human being, of course, since we don't educate humanity in the abstract, but educate individual human persons, and it is individual human persons doing the education, education is always something individual, by individuals of individuals. And though it will include this general conception of the human being, education will only succeed if it traces its path to the individual. And for Stein, there's a law of formation over gar um, overarching the educational venture, and that law of formation is law of formation about the human being, but more precisely, about the human individual. The human being has a law of formation, but each human individual also has a law of formation that must be respected by the educator. So that's the first point, of individuals, by individuals. The second point, for Stein, the means and goal of education is truth and clarity. Or we could say truth with clarity. Education is about the formation of true judgments, clear intuitions, and correct concepts. Now, when we understand education like this, we see that it's essentially personal. The personal is a ration, rational and free being, and education engages that rationality, true judgments, clear intuitions, and correct concepts. Now, at first, education is about the teacher communicating these true judgments, clear intuitions, and correct concepts to the student. But eventually, the educational venture gives way to the student's own encounter with truth. And indeed, it's always about this student's own encounter with truth. And this takes us to the third point. Education is a communal adventure between teacher and students. And therefore, the freedom of the students must be engaged in the educational venture. Education is never imposed for Stein. It's always proposed. It's an invitation to the student to enter into the encounter with truth, with clarity. Now, this common good of truth with clarity focuses both teacher and student. And with this focal point, the teacher and student attain a kind of inner unity, a unity of heart and mind. And without this, education is not a properly personal venture. It requires this dual focus upon the truth, proposed by the teacher and accepted and embraced freely by the student. Now, one thing that perhaps can bring this point home to us is something we're all experiencing this week. We've come together with a defined focus. We're trying to encounter truth from a personalistic perspective. And we've seen over the course of the week how friendships have begun to develop, how easy it is that we spend company with one another outside of these sessions. The dinners go on for hours. We end up late into the evening talking over uh, cigars and bourbon. And we all have to go to bed eventually, not wanting to because we're focused on the one thing, and there's a kind of friendly unity encountered in that. That's the educational venture. Finally, for Stein, education is done under the gaze of God. For Stein, God is the primary educator, and all other educators are personal instruments of the personal God. Now, to really draw home this point, I want to read another quotation, and it's on page 227 of your reading pack or page 122 in the, in the article, so 227. And it's the right-hand pane, a little less than halfway down, on the right-hand side, a sentence beginning with all created things. All created things are prefigured in the divine spirit, including the human being. He or she is a true human being when he or she is what God prescribes for a human to being to be. And this is as much true in general, in the general sense of being human, as in the quite specific sense of the individual personality. For every individual human being, there is in the divine spirit a prototype of that being prefigured, of what he or she should be. By this, though, we have described the goal of education. 
what else do we want to achieve by education other than that the young human being with whom we are entrusted becomes a true human being and truly himself or herself. She finishes this quotation with, but how is this goal to be reached? For Stein, in order to be educated, the human being as a true human being, the educator, him or herself, needs to be first a true human being. The educator needs to have attained a kind of mature encounter with the truth so as to introduce the student to this mature encounter with the truth. And only if the educator has, even if in an amateur way, already realized this encounter, can the education venture be begun. Next, the educator must do so in a living soul contact. Stein used this term, a living soul contact with the individual. This living soul contact is so significant for Stein because when we're looking at the formation of the human person, the human person won't unfold unless they live within a trusting environment within which they can unfold. And this trusting environment is established for the student by the teacher having a living soul encounter with the student. And this for Stein is ultimately about attention to the individual. Attention to the individual. Then the educator fosters an encounter with truth, like a midwife. The educator is not telling the truth like an authority, but pointing to the truth so as to foster in the student their own encounter with the truth. And as I said before, this eventually gives way to the student's own formation of true judgments according to clear intuitions, having correct concepts. And finally, for Stein, the teacher needs a reverential stance before the student. Now, this has two poles. First of all, it's a recognition that God is the primary educator, and therefore it's reverence for what God is doing in the life of the student. And then it's reverence for the student as an individual who's growing before the educator. Now, we, we, we've looked at the four points. We've looked at what needed by the teacher to be a true educator. How does this bear upon the topic of education that lasts? Well, obviously, when we consider education in this person, personalistic way, we see immediately how it lasts. Persons, unlike other mere things, are beings that are immortal according to their nature. And therefore, the education that forms the person is the education that lasts. Because persons do not fade away, but all other things that are non-personal will fade away. If we engage in the formation of human beings as persons, then it will be education that lasts. And as I said at the beginning, that's not merely intellectual, but includes the moral life, and in a decisive way. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Michael Healy. Uh, good morning. Um, wanted to talk a little about, in terms of education that lasts, uh, how we, we have to uh, touch the students on a deeper level than just everyday practical <coughs> concerns. And this can be expressed in various ways. Of course, Pieper contrasts the world of leisure and the world of work, or the world of wondering and marveling to practical concerns. You know, Martin Buber, I, thou, compared to I, it. Marcel, mystery compared to problem. Uh, Max Picard, in his wonderful little book, The World of Silence, sets this up as a contrast between the world of silence and the world of noise. And so let me uh, offer a few quotes about that, some from Picard, some from others. Picard says, listening is only possible when there is silence in man. Listening and silence belong together. And similarly, von Hildebrand, it's only in the passivity of silence that the things that have deeply impressed us may resound and grow in our soul and strike root in our being. Uh, back to Picard again, uh, criti criticizing the modern world, he says, almost the only kind of silence that there is today is due to the loss of the faculty of speech. It's purely negative, the absence of speech. It's merely like a technical hitch in the continual flow of noise. Uh, and then he elaborates, verbal noise is a pseudo language and a pseudo silence. That is to say, something is spoken, yet it's not real language at all. Something disappears in the noise, yet it's not real silence. When the noise suddenly stops, it's not followed by silence, but merely a pause 
in which the noise accumulates in order to expand with ever greater force when it's released. And I think this is the status of our students when they're immersed in uh, you know, modern uh, technology and all the rest of it. Um, I have one quote from Newman. It's, it's a short quote, but it's the longest quote I have, so I'm gonna cut it in half. Um, he's, in terms of other you know, implications of deeper levels to the human person, which we have to, um, which are already there, but the student has to become more aware of. Like with Kierkegaard, we have to catch up with ourselves. Newman writes, the foundations of the ocean, the vast realms of water which girdled the earth are as tranquil and as silent in the storm as in the calm, that is in the depths of the ocean. So it is with the souls of holy men. They have a well of peace springing up within them unfathomable, and though the accidents of the hour may make them seem agitated, yet in their hearts they are not so. And again, Kierkegaard from his book, The Works of Love, what refreshment do we get from all the busy bustle in comparison with that delicious quickening of the lonely wellspring which exists in every man, that wellspring in which the deity dwells in the profound stillness where everything is silent. And maybe one more quote from Mother Teresa. We need to find God, but he cannot be found in noise and restlessness. God is the friend of silence. See how nature, trees, flowers, grass grows in silence. See the stars, the moon and the sun, how they move in silence. We need silence to be able to touch souls. And so I, I think this is, this is part of the challenge of, of education, uh, how to uh, touch souls in these ways. Now, uh, of course, uh, Socrates famously says uh, uh, that philosophy begins in wonder uh, at being touched, not by design, but uh, by the happenstance of the situation of by, by something deeper, more mysterious, richer than we thought was there, sort of being reawakened. Um, and uh, St. Thomas, of course, says, the reason, however, why the philosopher may be likened to the poet is this, both are concerned with the marvelous, uh, and not to leave out math and science, uh, quote from Einstein, the most beautiful experience we can have is the mysterious. It is the foundation not only of religion uh, and, and uh, true art, but all, all true art and true science. He to whom this emotion is a stranger who can no longer wonder and stand wrapped in awe is as good as dead and certainly blind. And so we have to try to uh, bring occasions to uh, young people, to students of where they can experience the, that wonder and marveling. Now, um, Pieper, uh, the way I read it in Leisure, the Basis of Culture, unfolds at least four areas of uh, the world of leisure. The, the first, of course, is study as a liberal art, the search for wisdom, knowledge for its own sake, uh, which includes scenes like Socrates deci deciding that it's better to die than to commit an injustice, that's where they're wondering and marveling. Uh, and so questions of good and evil, life and death, as they come up in philosophy, in tragedy, in epic, uh, like the decision Achilles had to make before the walls of Troy that Socrates cites in his speech in the Apology. And so um, all of that is part of the world of leisure. Uh, secondly, what I bring under the notion of contemplative moments in life, in other words, moments where you're deeply touched by love and by beauty, sort of awaken a new level in you, a new level in reality that reveals something deeper than just practicality. Thirdly, of course, prayer and worship, uh, which Pieper acknowledges is the, 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 the uh, sort of the deepest source historically, every religion reserves certain times and places for higher purposes, not just for everyday practicality. And finally, he mentions play and recreation as a legitimate part of the world of leisure. And he, he says that there's a note in, the, in play and recreation of joy, uh, of joy in reality, joy in creation. The fact that the higher animals play, children have to play, 
St. Benedict required each of his monks, even though their motto was to work and to pray, he required each of his monks to have an hour of recreation every day. Uh, you couldn't just be tensely focused all the time on just prayer and labor. Uh, and so all this is important for education. Um, Pieper lists a half a dozen ways in which the everyday world can be broken into, broken through. The one is philosophy, of course, like Socrates deciding to die rather than to escape from prison, which he thought was wrong. He mentions poetry. Uh, you can think of the difference between the way William Wordsworth would look at a stand of trees and the way a lumberjack would look at a stand of trees, both legitimate, but on different levels. Pieper calls this incommensurable levels. Uh, and of course, if the lumberjack and the poet are the same guy, you recognize the problem. Uh, but um, thirdly, he mentions genuine prayer compared to simply trying to use prayer to get God to give you what you want. Uh, and then he talks about how a deep experience of love, uh, an experience of, of suffering or death, uh, a deep experience of beauty can all break into your planned day, your planned life, your planned week and month and year. And we have to, to uh, I think, uh, to help students to face life and be successful in life while they're in school through literature, through art, through music, uh, drama, we have to bring up situations like this. Uh, they have to be exposed to real beauty, to great love stories, to uh, great tragedies where people face uh, suffering and death and work through it even if they can't fully explain it, where, uh, uh, we, uh, where they can see that uh, suffering and death are, are more of a mystery than total darkness. They don't wipe out all hope. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, I guess uh, to conclude, let, let me list um, a number of what I think are practical suggestions since that's what the Thales Academy wanted. Uh, first, I would say and don't inundate the students with too much busy work, with too much quantitative busy work. Uh, they, they have to have time for silence and contemplation, for something to break through. So not just quantity and constant drills. Uh, secondly, don't make everything subject to tests. Uh, rather, what, what I find, especially in my uh, freshman and sophomore philosophy classes, but I try to work out something like it uh, in, on other levels too, have parallel readings. I mean, you have stuff you have to test them on, but have parallel readings uh, just for what I call personal response papers, where the students can freely emote in whatever way they like about the reading. Uh, and then you comment on that. You get into a dialogue with them by commenting on it. And no grade pressure, it's just pass-fail. If they don't do it, they get docked, however. And if they do all the response papers, they get extra credit. So they happily do all the response papers. Uh, I have them read The World of Silence in the person class, uh, Marcel's Homo Viatra in Metaphysics, von Hildebrand's Transformation in Christ in Ethics. And they just respond to the readings, and they love it. And the point is they share certain things personally in a response paper to the teacher they would never share in public in a discussion and hardly even admit to themselves. But, you know, they, the tremendous insights come out in these non-pressure kinds of assignments where they can just share and you can get in dialogue. Um, <clears throat> thirdly, uh, expose the students to great beauty. Uh, play music every morning. Uh, one of the most successful classes I had, I don't do this in every class, but in my Mar Texas of Marcel class, uh, we start out with a book on, on music in relation to Marcel because uh, long before he had developed a philosophy of hope and long before he converted to Christianity, and that was just before he was 40, when he was about 13, he was thinking of suicide, and what saved him was beautiful music, great music, which gave him some impression of a higher world he could participate in. And so that kept him going when he had a very difficult home life and school life. And so play great music. Now, you can't start him out on Mahler, but I think, you know, play some great marches from Sousa and Strauss and, and find some lively but beautiful music that can interest today's students 
who are more in, imbued with rap, which has no melody, nothing. But anyway, uh, but you have to find musical interest modern students, and um, and I would play it now. Uh, also, I mean, if you're playing a great march, let them get up and march around. Don't just keep them sitting in desks. My sister, who is herself uh, an educator, uh, she says the problem with elementary and even high school is it was, uh, it was formed by women for little girls to sit in desks. And boys have to get up and romp around more. Uh, that also reminds me, don't get rid of recess. <laughs> Uh, in favor of more heavy stuff. Uh, if you look it up on the internet, there's in, on the internet there's, you know, a dozen studies showing how important recess is, and that people get more done, and allow for friendly relations. We have uh, we have an elementary school here in town that decided to get so regimented that they wouldn't even let you sit freely with who you wanted to at lunch. You couldn't go sit with your friends. You had to sit in regimented tables assigned by teachers. This is terrible. What, what happens to camaraderie, like talking all evening? That you, you gotta let them sit with their friends and have a little freedom. Um, fifthly, I think there's a place for sports in terms of how it can instill a certain discipline, a certain responsibility, a certain brotherhood. Uh, a great example of that is uh, the, the movie uh, When the Game Stands Tall, uh, starring Jim Caviezel as the football coach, uh, having to do with this 151 game win streak of a Catholic school out in California in one of the poorest neighborhoods. And the whole theme through the movie is it's not about the streak. It's about building responsibility and brotherhood in you so that you can go out in the world and function as a responsible adult. Um, uh, no, uh, no iPads, no iPhones, no computers in class. Make them read a book, hold a book. Um, and finally, the, there, there ought to be regular times of prayer during the day. Now, if it's a non-denominational school, then regular times of recollection and contemplation to remind the students of doing something important here. But when I was in elementary school with the nuns, uh, we opened up with the morning offering. We paused mid-morning for prayer and before and after lunch. After lunch, she made us do the confiteor one time, shocked the whole class because Prayer was sacred to the Sister David Mary, was her name. Prayer, prayer was sacred, but one time she stopped the confiteor in the middle, and the class was totally shocked because we kept saying grievous instead of grievous. And she warned us, we say grievous one more time, we get detention. But in any case, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, prayer during the day is a reminder, so all these things are important for uh, trying to awaken that new level. Uh, one final quote from Kierkegaard, which is how Max Picard ends his book and, and, and ends my selection. Oh, it's in here, okay. And I, I used the chapter from, uh, from Picard, the final one on faith, uh, because uh, even though all kinds of wisdom and insight and understanding can, can happen independent of faith, relation to God is the deepest level. So Kierkegaard writes, the present state of the world and the whole of life is diseased. If I were a doctor and were asked for my advice, I would reply, create silence. Bring men to silence. The word of God cannot be heard in the noisy world of today. And even if it were blazoned forth with all the panoply of noise so that it could be heard in the midst of all the other noise, then it would no longer be the word of God. Therefore, create silence. So, you know, the truth can't just become another propagandistic voice. It has to touch that deeper level. All right. Thank you. Okay, so we'll hear now once again from Alex, um, who will address this again in the, from the perspective as a teacher at Thales Academy, doing all of this in the classroom, uh, perhaps already taking some of this advice, perhaps challenging some of this advice, but... Again, I wanted to thank everyone for having us here. This has been such an enriching time already. Um, it truly seems that this institution is um, a city on a hill in many regards to education. The fact that um, we have so many people here 
to celebrate and discuss and, and sharpen one another on how to take personalism seriously in our lives and in the classroom. Um, this is not everywhere. <laughs> this is certainly not everywhere. And so um, this, has been, this has been a great experience already this morning, and it's very, very encouraging for us to be here and, and hear this as well. Um, however, <clears throat> we still have the question, no matter you, if you're here at Thales Academy or anywhere, of education that lasts. That, that's the goal for us in many ways. We want to impart the right kind of education, and we want it to actually take hold, grow, be cultivated, and be lasting. We don't want it to simply wither and die when they leave our classrooms or we move out of the classroom. And so that, that needs to be at the forefront of our minds. And I think our panelists have done a great job detailing why that's important and even in many regards how we can implement those things. Um, and I just wanted to touch on that a little bit more. I remember when I first got the job, I was coming out of academia and um, teaching at a high school level was never something that was on my radar. Um, <laughs> I got into, I learned about Thales, loved what they were about, saw that they were uh, teaching philosophy. And as many of you know, if you can find a job teaching philosophy with a philosophy degree, you better take it um, and, and hold on to that. Uh, so they're gonna pay me to teach philosophy, I will, I will do that. Um, I started thinking about though, what kind of teacher I wanted to be. And really, this question was at the forefront of my mind. How could I be a teacher that made education last for their students? And I started thinking about the teachers that I had had, professors, teachers in high school, elementary school. And I really started contemplating this and, and trying to figure out what was it about them. And I also started realizing that the content, and, and maybe you guys can, can agree with this, the content that I remembered most from my classes, be it college, high school, whenever, oftentimes came from the teachers, the instructors, the professors that connected with me most personally. I don't think that's a coincidence. And, and when I think about that, it's both saddening in many ways, um, but also encouraging. Sad because I realized how many things I forgot, how many of my courses I didn't remember, how many of my instructors I no longer remembered. And that's the sad reality. Students pay a lot of money to come to institutions to learn, and oftentimes they will forget them. Teachers, professors, you'll forget a lot of your students if you teach long enough. That's the nature of what we're doing, but how do we make that education last? How do we try our best to make sure that the information that we're imparting to our students is remembered and also the character development is remembered? And those two things are really tied together. So one of the things that I think need to be the focus of all of our education um, is, first of all, character development from the, the point of the teacher, but a second one would be exploration. I wanna talk about the, that character development. You model that as a teacher. You model that as an instructor. You need to set up a classroom that allows, allows for discussion, allows for respect, allows for each of us to interact with one another without fear of what we say in class, without, without fear of our ideas. It isn't to say that we just simply allow any heresy or anything else that, that comes up in class to stand on its own, but we create an environment that allows students to feel comfortable to do that. I think that that's really, really important. And for the, the teacher, where that starts is humility. That takes, and we've, our panelists touched on that in various ways. You have to have, to be a successful teacher, to have an education that lasts, you have to have the utmost humility. I don't remember the teachers that that came in and lorded over the classroom, that, that just simply came to sit in their authoritative seat and impart knowledge apart from anything else. They read off their PowerPoint for an hour and a half. Um, it's the same one they've been doing for however many years. Um, they remember it word for word. There's no interaction with the students and then they leave. You probably don't remember those 
people as much. You probably don't remember that information as much. But the teachers that came in and showed an interest, that told you they cared about you, that you, could, you knew that you could go to them after class and just spend time talking to them about life and those things. And that really ties back into what we talked about in the previous session. When you learn these ideas, the good teachers, to make that education last, what they did is they showed you how these things applied to your life. So we had the question earlier in the last session um, about teaching great books. And how do, what do we do with Homer? How do we make that last? How do we make that pertinent to our students? And I've taught Homer um, several times. And uh, I'll, I'll bring Achilles up because we talked about that. My students, they don't care about the Iliad, right? They don't care about Achilles um, at first. However, what we do is we start to show them that just like Achilles went and got so angry because his pride was hurt, because his wife was taken from him and all these other things, he got so angry that he actually requested that Zeus would, would bring wrath upon his own people. Our students aren't experiencing that, but the human condition hasn't changed. It hasn't changed over the last 2,000 years. The same principles that fueled these characters in these books are the same things that are fueling our, our students in these decisions, the same things that are fueling us in these decisions. And when we're able to strip away those, those, those cultural contexts, not divorce them, but strip them away down to the principles behind them, and then show how that applies today in their lives, that's how we get an education that lasts. And the way that we do that is through discovery. So we lead our students on a path to discovery. We don't, we don't simply regurgitate this information to them. Um, we lead them to it. We allow them to discover it. I think all of us can, can relate to that. When you figure something out, somebody could have told you something 100 times, but when you figure something out, something just clicks. And that's when you know it. You've experienced it. You understand it. So just very quickly, what that looks like for me in the classroom whether it's literature or philosophy. Um, we will have an assigned reading that's source material, and they'll read one of these great thinkers, writers. There'll be an assigned passage. They'll come in at the beginning of class, and they'll simply, I'll, I'll assess, first of all, the intellectual things, the knowledge that they need to know. So there'll be a short little assessment, um, basic things that they should know if they, if they actually did it. And that builds character as well. And then there's always at least one, sometimes two questions that we would call core questions at Thales that make up the uh, core, the meat of our Socratic discussions. And that allows them, and it typically has to do with how to apply this in today. How did you react to this? So similar to um, what our panelists said about these response papers, right? It allows them to just simply put down, organize their thoughts, um, and think through these things. And then what we'll do is after that, um, I'll make sure that they understood the knowledge base of it, and we'll spend the rest of the class starting off springboarding with that question that everyone in the class has had a chance to think about, relate to, and understand, and we'll just have a conversation. And that leads to places, as, as uh, we pointed out in the last session, that you would never expect as a teacher. Now, it's difficult. I would say in some ways it's, it's more difficult than lecturing um, because you have to be ready for everything. But it also takes certain qualities of a teacher. You have to be critically minded, but you can't be harsh. You've got to have conviction about what you believe, but you also have to be generous as a teacher. Um, you have to be gentle with them. You have to be respectful, and you have to be humble. Because when a student brings something up that's clearly false and wrong and should not be believed, for me to simply shoot that down and say, well, no, that's actually not right. Somebody have a different answer. Right? That does something to the person of the student. What that shows our students is that we care about knowledge more than we care about the person. And that's what this whole conference is about, showing that we care. So maybe we would say, well, why don't we think about this rather than saying it's wrong? What would you do with this? Right? And then you'll have somebody else will bounce it off of that idea and that idea and that idea. And before long, you've got them coming to a point where they realize, I have conflicting beliefs. <laughs> I can't hold to this and this. And that tension, that's where that critical thinking, that's where understanding true knowledge, I think that's, that's really where we want our students to be through direction and guidance. So 
Um, thank you guys for having us. Um, I want to keep, I probably went over already, um, so I apologize. But think about those things. If we want an education that lasts, we have to show and model that humility as, a, as an instructor. And we've also got to lead by exploration and discovery in our teaching. Thank you. Thank you. So now we'll, we'll hear from Wanda Evans, who uh, is a first grade teacher at Thales Academy. And unlike probably most of us in this room, uh, her challenge is not teaching just in one discipline, but teaching everything that is taught to those students. So this will be a very interesting perspective. So. Right, yeah. Um, I have a totally different background than the majority of you here. My classroom looks a lot different than Alex's classroom. Um, just teaching first grade, the kids are willing to do anything for you if they feel like you value them and you value them as a person and their background knowledge, their background experiences. And I think that that our goal as educators is to figure out how we take our students, especially the six and seven year olds that I teach and how we mold them into lifelong learners. Um, that's a big concept for a first grader to get. They're not thinking about next year, you know, graduation. They're thinking about, Miss Evans, what are we having for snack today? You know, that is where their minds are. They're not thinking that far in the future. But as a teacher in the classroom, it's your goal. You have to be thinking about that and how to form them into the best person possible. Thales does a great job with um, our 15 outcomes. We have 15 outcomes that are posted in every classroom. Um, a big poster and we go through those throughout the year so that the kids really understand them and we take the time to use them as learning moments. A big one of those is being a continuous learner to take all aspects of their life, the things that they learn, um, how to then adapt to different changes or different mistakes that they've made in their ideals. Um, and uh, how we as educators try to get um, instill in them a desire to take what they know and how to expand on those basic ideas, how to question things deeper. Um, the first thing I would say is to walk into a classroom and with your kids, show them that you value them. Everybody has a different background. That comes with different skill sets, different um, different knowledge bases and the way they see different parts of the world, which is not wrong, it's different. Um, so I think just showing them how much you value them. A child knows different things in different ways than an adult does. <clears throat> they experience the world in a, in a much smaller way in certain aspects than an adult does. So taking their experiences, their backgrounds, their points of view, all of it is detrimental to the success of a classroom every year. Without that one child and what they bring to the classroom, your classroom's gonna fail without them. It's not you, it's them. You're constantly learning from them. Um, you know, a, the second thing, and Alex hit on it, is to be humble. It's okay not to know. I don't know everything. Students, especially in first grade, think you know everything because you live at school. <laughs> we don't. Um, it's a real shock when they see me out and about in the city, right? Um, so that's what they think you do. They think you know everything. They'll tell their parents, no, 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 that's not the way Miss Evans did that math problem. You know, I can't do it that way. And I tell them all the time, I don't care how you get it, just get it. Like, learn from one another. If I'm not, if I cannot verbalize the, a certain way of teaching you something that you understand, I'm okay with the neighbor showing you how to do it. Learn from each other. Um, and in my classroom, we are really big with the team dynamic and helping one another out. I, I think also for the kids to know that if you don't know it, this is how I'm gonna fi figure it out. So sometimes when I'm writing something on the board, they'll, t they'll pull random words out for writing that I need to know how to spell that I didn't plan on spelling that day, so I probably don't know how many S's it's got in there, 
or if it's got two Ps or what on some of these challenging words that they will, honest to God, come up with. And I'm trying to write it out. And so I'll say, oh, wait, I don't know if this has, I, I, I don't know if this guy has one P or, or two Ps. Can you help me figure it out? How, how would we figure it out? And then you can model it and show them, okay, well, I go to the dictionary, or this is how I'm going to look it up. Or you can say, hey, um, Eden, will you go over to the dictionary and look this word up for me and just let me know. We'll, we'll, we're going we're gonna to keep working and then let us know. The fact that you're the teacher who knows everything and you're asking them to help you figure something out, for them, it has just made their day, their year. They think that they are super smart, and they are, you know, and you, you've, you've given them a task, especially the, the challenging kids who probably need to take a moment to get out of their desk and walk across the classroom because they can't contain themselves. Um, it, it's okay to say you don't know and to refer to them as experts. I had one kid this past year, Oliver, his goal in first grade, when you ask him what they want to be, he wants to be a marine biologist. He knows what that is. He knows so much more about any animal that lives in the ocean or probably a good chunk of them that live on land than I do, and I love animals. And so I would always refer to him with animal questions. Or when somebody else had a question, go ask Oliver. I mean, he loved that. And he loved that I knew he was an expert in it because I valued them. I got to know them. Um, I got to connect with them and, and their families. So I, I think that that's, that's okay. You know, these these ways of showing kids that you believe that they are capable of being a lifelong learner and this is how you can do it. Just even from first grade, being able to show them that in small ways, if they know that you value them, they will do anything for you. And that is the easiest way to then have classroom management, everything else will fall straight into place when they know that you value them as a learner.